Excellent. Thank you, Casey. Let that, uh, let that be our prayer and our reminder this morning. God, thank you for choosing us, for loving, loving the whole world, all the people here, and for sending your son to die for our sins, desiring that relationship to be restored, the relationship that we broke but you sent your son on a rescue mission for our hearts. And we appreciate and we thank you for that. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. If you have a Bible, we're gonna open it up to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, it's in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 21, we'll pick up the reading in verse one there. Uh, and it is, a, it is a beautiful spring day out there, balmy 72 degrees. Got a little sunburn on my bald head this morning as I was walking in. That's not true, but it's okay. It can be rainy and cold and snowy outside, but I'm excited. I'm excited. Because like Casey said, this is the beginning of Holy Week. This is the week where we remember Resurrection Sunday, where we get to remember and take time out of our busy week and take time to, to designate time to remember the greatest gift ever. Jesus came from heaven to earth to live a sinless life, to give himself for us. That's what we're taking time this week to remember. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And we're going to read the, 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 the story of when Jesus rides into Jerusalem. Now, he's been on earth. He's ministered for a couple years here, and he's got some followers, and he's got some, he's got some enemies as well. But he rides into Jerusalem, and he lets the people praise him. And it's, 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 it's coming near to the end. Chapter 21, verse 1. As they approach Jerusalem... And came to Beth Page on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples ahead, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say, The Lord needs him, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt. The full of a donkey. I appreciate this. Think about this for a second. Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem on a donkey. Come in. He enters as a king, but as a humble king. Your king comes to you gently. What an appropriate way for the servant king to come in to Jerusalem. Not with this trumpet and the, and the, uh, the pomp and circumstance of a, of a noble earthly king. He comes in on a lowly donkey to be the servant, to be the humble king who would give himself for us. The disciples went, verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed him. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The crowds welcomed him by saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna is an interesting word. Sometimes we just think maybe it's, it's like hallelujah or just a praise. It's a little more than that. If we look back to, uh, to Psalm, Psalm chapter 118, keep, keep your bookmark, put, put a bolt in here or something. We're going to go back, Psalm 118. Psalm 118. See, Hosanna is a word that is a, is a transliterated word. What we did when the, 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 the Bible translators were, were working with the Greek manuscripts and translating it to English, there were some times where they got to words and they said, I don't know what to, the, the parallel is, so let's just use the, the English letters for these Greek letters, and let's just move this, this Greek word from Greek into English, but with English letters. And so they translated it over, uh, transliteration. Uh, so words like apostle, if you were to read the Greek, apostle is apostle in Greek as it is in English. Baptism, uh, Christ, deacon, there are lots of words that are transliterated where they, they have Hosanna in the Greek, and they say, we have nothing better, so let's just make it Hosanna in the English. Now, those who wrote the New Testament, they did the same thing with the Greek. They said, we have nothing better. Let's just go back to the Hebrew and borrow the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word comes from Psalm 118, verse 25. Psalm chapter 118, verse 25. Lord, save us. 
Lord, grant us success. That phrase right there, save us, that's Hosanna. Lord, save us. And so when Jesus comes into the town, when he's coming into the town, the people are shouting, Hosanna. They're essentially saying, save us. Literally, that's our plea. Save us, son of David. We remember that Jesus would fulfill the prophecy of being of the line of David. He would be the king. David was the king of the Old Testament. There was Saul, then there was David and Solomon and a line of other guys. Some did good, some failed miserably. But back to Matthew chapter 21. The people see Jesus coming into town as a king, and they shout, save us, son of David. Hosanna, son of David. And I wonder why they're shouting, save us. What are their reasons? When I read this story, I get a mixed, mixed bag of emotions. And so as, I, as, as, as we read it this morning, I, I want to look at some of the different characters and their responses to Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. And I want you to answer this question. Which person would you have been? Which person are you in this story? If Jesus was to come into town, how would you respond? How would you react? We're going to look at some different reactions here, some different responses here. Some are good. Some struggle. But the first response we see is from those in the crowd, not all of them, but those in the crowd in verse 9. The crowds that went ahead of him and those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Those who looked at Jesus as their king and said, save us, king. We are so excited that you're here. And we anticipate what you will do. Those in the crowd who were excited, joyful, and anticipating what Jesus would do. This, this is the place where we want to be. Jesus comes into your life, comes into your town, comes into your world, and you're excited. You, you, you see him as your savior, and you're excited about who he is and what his plan is to come and to do for you. Now, I want us to add a little, a little something to this definition here. Because I put those in the crowd, I didn't put everyone in the crowd, because I'm sure not everyone felt the same way. But I want us to put that, write this down, I want to put those who were anticipating Jesus for the right reason. For the right reason. Because I think some people were excited about Jesus coming into town for the wrong reason. If you were a good Jew, you were tired. You were fed up of the Roman rule. And you wanted someone to come in and to stand up for you. And this Messiah, this would be a good person to do that job. And so we finally got this king that the Old Testament has been talking about for so long. And Jesus is going to come in and he's going he's to take out Rome. He's going to put them in their place, and we can switch things around, and then Israel and the Jewish nation can be back on top, and we can take over this land, and it can be good, and we can have a worldly king. And so they're excited about Jesus. Yes, a worldly king, this is a good thing. We are excited about you, about you, Jesus. I think they missed the boat. I think they missed the Savior. Because Jesus was not here to come and be a worldly king, an earthly king. Jesus came to to save us from something much bigger than political rule. He came to save us from our sins. So the phrase, Hosanna to the Son of David, is an accurate statement, but for the right reasons, that Jesus came to save us from our sins. And so I have to ask you, when you come to Jesus, when you see Jesus Christ, when you, when you, when you were first introduced to him, were you excited? Yes or no? And for what reason? Did you say, save us, Jesus? For what reason? I, I, the Bible tells us to cast all of our cares and all of our anxieties on, on our Lord. To present all our requests to him. Because he cares for us. He does. But what's the single most important thing that we turn to Jesus for? Save us from sin? Or save us from Bad weather. I mean, think about it. Think about your prayer life here for a second. Is it, is it Jesus, I need this job? Or is it Jesus, I need to be forgiven of my sins? Is it Jesus, I come to you because I need stuff on this earth? Because I need you to be a cosmic butler who's here to wait on my table? Or a benevolent uncle? that has a good job and no kids and just buys you stuff all the time? 
Or do we look at Jesus and say, I need you to save me from my sin? Because that's the most important thing that I need your help with. And so as Jesus comes to this town, the crowd is excited. But are they excited for the right reason? As you come to Jesus Christ, as you come to church, are you excited about Jesus for the right reason, for the salvation from sin? I think sometimes we come to Christ and we say, we're, we're here and we're excited about you because we're excited about what you're going to do because we need you to get me a job. We need you to, to get me some good weather. We need you to get my, my health concern covered. We need you to get all of these things done here in this world. And he does. He cares about those things. But, but I remember him saying in, in, in the book of John, John 16, 13, if you, if you remember this one, you can write it down, John 16, 13, in this world you will have what? Trouble. That's a promise. In this world you will have trouble. But don't worry, you're a Christian and I will exempt you from all of them. That's not what it says. And, and I'll prove it to you. We can go there right now. John 16. John 16. If you are looking for a health and wealth gospel, I'm sorry to disappoint you. That's not me. I'll tell you what the Bible does say. John 16, health and wealth gospel would be someone who would stand up here and say, if you just love Jesus, he'll give you that new job, you'll get nice hair, and you'll get a, all your health concerns will be healed, and he will, he will fix everything, and you will be loaded. You'll probably have a Ferrari by Friday. That's what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Your team next season is going to go 12 and 0. You're going you're to win them all if you just love Jesus more. That's, that's, not, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Because I look at John 16, 33, Jesus speaking, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace, not a Ferrari. In me you may have peace. Because in this world you will have trouble. You, that is a promise. Are you in this world? Yes or no? Yes, we're all here. And if you're here, you will have trouble. You will have disagreements. You will lose your temper. You will have to apologize to someone. You will get sick. People you love and care for will have terminal illness. This will happen. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus has overcome the world. He's beaten this world. Because of what he did, he saves us from this world. This isn't the end game. If it was, Ohio, oh, but, it, but it's not. Ohio's good sometimes, but, but, but the end game is not here. It's not here. We've been forgiven of our sins, and one day we will be reunited with our Heavenly Father in heaven. That's, that's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I'm excited about. And so when I come to Jesus, I don't make uh, bargains with him. If you only save this person or heal this person or give me this job or do this for me, then, then I'll know that you love me. We don't do that. We come to Jesus Christ and we, we ask him to, to take care of our biggest, most important problem, sin. Save us from sins, please. He says, I can do that. And he and he alone takes our place and saves us from our sins. And so we come to Jesus with excitement, with joy, with anticipation for the right reasons, for the right reasons. And we look to him as our savior. And so these people in, in, in Matthew chapter 21, I wonder if all of their hearts were good as the crowd sees Jesus and they say, Hosanna to the son of David, save us king. I wonder if their hearts are good or if some are, some are just thinking, I want to be in charge of Jerusalem. I'm sick of being bossed around by these Roman soldiers. I want you to come in here and set up a world of the kingdom. I wonder if their hearts are good. I wonder if our hearts are good, if we're excited about Jesus for the right reason. We're going we're gonna to go over to Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four of the Gospels, tell the story of Jesus. Okay, And Luke adds a detail that I think is important for us this morning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's three books, two books to the right. Uh, Luke chapter 19. Luke's going to add a detail to this story I think is appropriate because it shows us another example of people and how they respond to Jesus. Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Some are excited. Some are going to get angry. Luke chapter 19, 
Uh, verse 34, we see the disciples going to get the colt. Uh, they put their cloaks on him. Jesus is riding in. Um, verse 37. So Luke chapter 19, verse 37. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd, the Pharisees are the religious leaders, they said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Tell them to be quiet. Why would they respond like that? Because for three years they've seen Jesus' popularity grow. And for three years they've seen him fulfill the messianic prophecies. And they don't like it. Because it's not what they wanted. And it's not how they had pictured Jesus to be. And so they're annoyed. They're angry. And they reject him. Jesus responds in verse 40. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The religious leaders rejected and grew angry towards Jesus. Number two, the religious leaders, they rejected and they grew angry towards Jesus. Jesus came into town. They looked at him and they said, that's not what I pictured. That's not what I had in mind. You're going to take the people's attention off of us and put it on yourself. I don't want that to happen. I kind of like being in charge. And so you know what? I, I, I reject you. Jesus, the religious leaders speaking here, the religious leaders thinking here, they've lost their place of power. This king has come, and he has no place for them in their hearts. They rejected Jesus, and they grew angry towards him. I wonder if sometimes if, if our religion rejects Jesus and a relationship with him. When the Bible calls us to do something or, or convicts us to do something, we think, We've never done it that way before, Jesus. You're asking us to change? You should know this is the church. We don't change anything. Our, our actions, the paint color on the walls, a long list of other things we do, because this is, this is our religion. But Jesus steps in and says, I need you to follow me. I need you to follow me each and every day. It, it, would we get angry? If Jesus came in and told us to, to make a change in our heart, have we created a Jesus in our mind that, that affirms of all the choices we make? I think a lot in the world do that today. I think a lot in the world have, have created this Jesus that affirms this choice and that choice and has excused all of their sins. That's, that's not the Jesus I read about in the Bible. And so, so when Jesus shows up, these, these false religious people get mad at him. And they reject him. Do you reject Jesus Christ and in, in exchange hold on to a fake, false religion that looks good, but at the heart of the matter, it misses a relationship with Jesus Christ? The religious people tried to put Jesus into their box of what he should have looked like, and Jesus said, no, it's the other way around. I'm going to change your heart to put your heart into mine to look like mine. So the religious leaders, they rejected him, and Jesus follows it up of their rejection. Jesus follows it up in verse 41. Another group of people here. As he approached Jerusalem, he looks at this city, and his heart breaks. He wept over it, verse 42, and he said, if you, if you even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and circle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. He's talking about the, um, uh, the, the siege that will happen on Jerusalem in 40 years, the destruction of the temple and, and, and what will come to Jerusalem. But this is what I want to focus on here. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. I'm going to read that last part again. You did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus is there. I mean, he, he's there in Jerusalem, and the people reject him. They don't even see him. Those who knew, but they chose to reject him. Number three, those who knew, but they chose to reject him. Now, remember what's going on here. This is, this is Passover. Passover is happening, and so there are tons of people there in Jerusalem. 
Now, why are they there for Passover? Because they're good religious people, because they know their scriptures, because they have a Bible, but they're missing the part about Jesus. They, they know that the Messiah is coming, but they don't like this one. And so they know, but they, they reject him. I wonder how many people in America know about Jesus Christ. Let me think about that for just a second. How many people in America know about Jesus Christ? Even the slightest bit of knowledge about Jesus Christ, I would imagine it's probably a pretty high percentage. How many choose to reject that knowledge of him and live a different way? I would think that would be quite a high percentage as well there too. How many people drive by a church each and every day of their life but don't get involved? How many people own a Bible but it sits at home and gathers dust? How many people own a library card? Anybody here have a library card? Anybody have a library card? I'm pretty sure you can fact check me on this. If you go to your library, you might even be able to check out a Bible for free. You get a Bible there. We, we are inundated with the gospel. It is absolutely everywhere. And yet, for some reason, a large percentage of America, a large percentage of the world, just says, no thanks. No thanks, I'm not interested. We're not persecuted, so that, that's not the reason. We're not persecuted. We're just too busy. Whatever the reason is, but for a lot of people, they, they know about him, but they choose to reject him. Church, this is an opportunity. These next two, this is all, all of these, is an opportunity for us to live out our mission, to minister to these people that missed Jesus Christ because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Salvation is here, and it's presented to the world through Jesus Christ. And it's presented through our message of truth and of love. And that gives us the opportunity to minister to these people who have rejected Christ and share that with them, to share with them who Jesus Christ is. And so these people in the story, they turn their back on him. If that's your story today, I'm glad that you're here. I encourage you to ask questions. Why do you not believe? What is it? I would love to sit and talk with you about that. It'd be a great conversation to have. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 21. There's one last group of people. One last group of people. Very similar to this one we just mentioned, but I think this is an important one. Matthew chapter 21, verse 10. The last one I want to end with. We have the people who are excited about Jesus. I hope that they're excited for the right reason. We have those who are the religious angry, who are just angry. This is not what we anticipated. There are those who, who willingly reject him. Uh, they knew about him, but they chose just to reject him and just say, you know what, not interested. And then there's the last group, chapter 21, verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Who, who is this? Who is this Jesus guy? For some reason, there are some people in Jerusalem who have been, they just haven't found out about it. Now, don't fault them. They don't have news and instantaneous connection through the internet and I don't know if it's good or bad, um, but, but word hasn't traveled to these people yet. And so they, they hear all this uproar, and they see this guy coming in on a donkey, and they're scratching their head and say, who's this? Who is Jesus? Those who don't know. Those who didn't know about Jesus yet. There are those in this world who don't know about Jesus, and let me, let me, maybe, maybe I need to change it a little bit. Don't know clearly about who Jesus is. Maybe they have a distorted view of Christ. And maybe it's time for you to help to set them straight. Maybe their view of Christ starts out with the fact that um, God hates them because they're a sinner. That, that's not true. God loves them. God loves each and every person in this world, and I wonder if everybody understands that. So, so maybe there are those who, who don't know who Jesus is, and we can help to tell them. That's why I put the yet in there, because that's our calling, church, to fulfill the yet. When people say, Who, who's this? You speak up and you say, that's my, that's my Lord and Savior who saves me from my sins. The most important thing I've ever been saved from, the most important gift I've ever received. 
those who don't know, those who don't know accurately a full correct definition of who Jesus Christ is. This is the, um, this is a great time of the year to explain to someone, to show them the love of Christ and the forgiveness found only in Jesus and God's Son. And we've been saved, we've been forgiven from our sins. That's the best, anybody agree with that? That's the best thing you've ever received in your entire life. I, I need nothing else. Maybe some warmer weather, but not really. That's just details, it's just minor details. The best thing I need is a God who loves me, I got that, and a Savior who took my place and forgives me of sins. I'm set, I'm set. Let's take that message to the world, church. Let me pray. God, I pray that we can appreciate the forgiveness, appreciate the love, appreciate the grace. You did it all, and we freely accept that. We thank you for loving, for choosing, and for caring for each and every one of us. And God, I pray that you will give us the words and the boldness and the grace and the compassion to go into this world and to share that message with others. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Every Sunday, this is true. You can come forward and you can surprise me and say, today's the day, Mike. I got surprised last week. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Come forward and say, today is the day. I want to make Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to be baptized today. I believe in him. I confess as my Lord and Savior, and I repent for my sins. I want to be baptized. I want to be a Christian today. I pray that you will make that choice as we stand and sing our song of invitation.